Welcome to second half of OP244. My name is Fardad. Um, I'll, be take care of, I'll be taking care of OP244 for these nine people who are sitting over here for some reason. Se section A is jam-packed, like 35 people in it. B is like this, and Z is the same, so it's interesting. Uh, we'll see. All right. Uh, so, uh, sorry you have the monitor in your face, but it's a personal thing for you. As well. <laughs> so you can see it nicely. So, um, 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 because I take the second half, usually what I do is like when I'm teaching half and half, the first week I'll try to bring you up to speed and go through to see what is your knowledge. So I'll go through your knowledge and talk to you and see what do you know and what you don't. And uh, the fact that are the, the, the half of you are not here, uh, kind of disappointing, but um, I'll send them a message and let them know. Yeah, what's up? It is recording, yes, let me see. <clears throat> yeah, recording, mic's on, that's on, we're good. Thank you, always do that check, please, because many times you'll see I'll do the recording and, and it's just that with no audio. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the very first thing that I'm going to tell you is that, um, unfortunately, you have to go through specific things before you continue your uh, 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 semester, and that's workshop zero. You have to do the workshop zero. You have to create a repository you, uh, on Git. You need to know basic stuff, how to work with Git. Your communication with me goes through Git. Uh, GitHub, I mean. If you had it from last semester, you're fine. Well, I think everyone that did last time. Who was, what, what was his name? Oh, Rania did that. Thank you, I should. Okay, so, so uh, workshop zero, you have done it? Yeah, so do it, please. <laughs> So, but anyway, so so if you have if you if you already have it, fine. Add me as a collaborator. But it's a playlist over here. That those videos are a playlist. I created it for IPC one four four. Hello. Da, 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 da. All right. So it's for IPC, but it doesn't matter. Whenever you hear C, you it's C plus plus. Okay. So um, the the list of it's not actually for that. For it's for all three semesters. So you go through the list. These are the the videos one by one goes through it. So it starts from installing Visual Studio. I've done it. Don't do it. If you have Visual Studio code on your computer and you're a PC user, throw it away. Visual Studio, no code, OK? Or I don't know. Don't throw it away. I don't save it somewhere and don't use it. If you're using Apple, you can use Xcode. I believe somewhere in there um, I have uh, installation of Xcode, I think. Somewhere in this list I have how to do Xcode and how to do compilation. The only thing you need to do where I say choose C as a language, you choose, you choose C++. Um, everything and all the commands that are done over here are uh, 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 set through GitHub. So what happens, um, what GitHub is, if you don't know, I'm just going to go quickly. Uh, um, first, Earth got cold and the dinosaurs came ate too much. and then the computer programs came, and somebody like Linus Torvald created a, uh, uh, an operating system called Linux. It was an amazing thing, and um, made it open so everybody can collaborate and add to it. And then it became so big it couldn't handle it, so Mr. Torvald created another tool called Git. That Git was supposed to manage millions of people, thousands of people, collaborating on the same project so the code doesn't get a mishmash type of thing. Just imagine that you get, a, get some code from your friend and try to integrate it with yours. Imagine now you have 1,000 friends, and each one of them are doing a little bit of fiddling with your code, and you want to. That's crazy, right? That's Git. <clears throat> Git is a program you can install on your computer, and it, create, it changes a simple directory folder on your computer into a repository which Git, like a big brother, is always watching. Taking crap, taking, taking crap, no. Taking, <laughs> taking uh, uh, tracks all the things you have done on your, your repository so you can look at the history, you can look at the changes and all the good stuff. Uh, <clears throat> and you can uh, 
install Git on another computer and clone this repository on the other computer. Now you have two people working on it. So the first person does something on one repository and the other person is doing something on the second repository that is a clone of the first one and the, the second person sends its code to the first one and uh, it merges that into the code either automatically or under your supervision and it syncs the two repositories. So it, you can have that on 10 computers and everybody can collaborate. It became a little too confusing, so this company took opportunity to, to make money out of it. So they created uh, this humongous cluster of servers and they called it GitHub. GitHub is essentially just another computer with a Git repository on it. <clears throat> we call that place upstream. You know, fish goes upstream to, and then, you know, it's, it's like that. So upstream essentially means the main repository. You clone the main repository, you do your stuff, and you always push things back upstream to the GitHub repository. In these series of YouTube videos that you see over here, I'm teaching you how to create a repository on Git, have that repository cloned on your computer using that repository. When I say repository, you are hearing folder. It's the same thing. You do all your OOP244 work in that folder, everything, your tests, anything you do, and you keep committing over and over your work. So you go to washroom, commit, going to washroom, come back. Okay, you yawn, yawning, commit. So you keep committing. All these commits are turning points, places you can come back to later on. So three days from now, you say, oops, I made a mistake, mistake. I wish I could change my code when I was going to the washroom. You can do that. You can go back to that commit, roll back to that one, or simply see what are the changes so you can figure out how things work. Better than that, you can add moi as, your, as a collaborator to your GitHub repository. Therefore, I will have read-write access to your repository. You have a problem with your assignment, your project, your workshop, you send me a message for that, I have a problem, you need to talk. We go online, I'm gonna say, did you push your changes into, push your work into GitHub? You would say yes. You send me the URL of your GitHub repository, I clone it on my computer first time. That's next time I'm just going to pull it. And I have your code over there. I share my screen with you, open up the code, fix your code, push it to your repository. All you need, do you, all you need to do is a pull. You do a pull, it applies all my changes to your code. Your responsibility would be only to compare the code that it was and it is and reflect on it and to, to what I did to fix it and you're clear to go. That's how we do work in here, okay? <clears throat> Although it sounds like too much, but now you're only using five commands of Git. One is clone, you only do it first time, once, to clone a repository into another computer. You do pulls, which means you are ch getting information, new information from repository and syncing your repository with upstream. You do commit, it means you apply changes to your Anything that you change, you change your code, you commit, it commits the code to the repository. You do add, it adds new files to the repository. So when you add a file to a directory, it, it, the Git doesn't know, it's the, it, Git doesn't care about it. Git only cares about it when you tell this is added to the repository, take care of it, look after it. And you do push. Push sends all the commits and add additions and everything to, to upstream. These five things. You're going to have conflicts, things may not work, then you contact me. Far that my repository is dead, I can't do anything, I'll fix it for you. <clears throat> what I want you to do is to start using Git. You graduate of Arsenica, if you don't know how to work with Git, you're going nowhere. Nobody's going to hire you. And this day, they might hire you, but the very first day you're going to go over there and say, this is your repository, do this and that. And you're going to go, what the hell am I supposed to do? So, <clears throat> and when some, when when you're in competition, you have like 1,000 applications for a, work, for a job, the very first thing they do, they Google your name. And guess what comes up? Your GitHub repository or your Git profile. As soon as they see Git, it's like a green light flashing, hire me, okay? It means this person knows how to program. This person knows how to collaborate on Git, okay? And I'm not joking when I'm telling you this. 
Git is the heart of an industry right now. You're going to hear things like Kubernetes. You're going to hear something like containers. You are uh, going to hear things like pods and things like that when you go in higher levels of stuff. And you're all going to see that these are all just Git. You are committing your code right now. You know what they are committing to Gits now? Operating systems. You send a computer to Git and you create new instances out of Git. You create several computers. They call pods. So that's Git too, but in a higher level. So when you know how Git works now, somehow, somewhat, as you're going further, because now it's easy, it's just OP244. When you're going to 345 and all the good stuff that we had, at that time, you've got to get more polished with it. You're going to learn new stuff. And by the time you're going out, you've got to be comfortable with Git. I do not know anybody who knows Git completely. So don't worry if you don't know it. There is a book over there <clears throat> that you have it in the notes that it says, uh, or you can just type open, Git open book. It's called open because it's open source. It's a book. Read chapter one, two, and six. It's, there's like 50 pages. You know more than me. OK? That's Git. Done. The rest of the stuff. Let's go through it. So um, I do not do emails. If you send me an email, ignore it and do it in Teams now. OK? All our communications happen through, through uh, Teams. Please give me this week to get ready. I came back on Tuesday. So I have to set things up. As soon as I set things up, so by end of the week, I'm going to set everything up. And my, everything that I have will be up to date and recent. And you can trust it. When I say trust it, is the calendar. When you want to see me, um, <clears throat> respect the dot, OK? If that dot is green or yellow, no matter what time it is, you can call me. 3 o'clock in the morning, call me. 11 o'clock, noon, morning. If that is green or yellow, call me. I might not be there to answer, but I'll see a missed call and I'll reply to you as soon as I come back, OK? Or if you see that's red, it means please don't call me now, or it's busy, or something like that, you can always send me a message. Tell me what your problem is. One thing I forgot to mention to other two classes. I hate, and I cannot put enough stress out of that word, I hate screenshots and pictures of code. That's for TikTok when you're 13 years old. Don't do that, OK? Especially, you see they take their cell phone out, take a sideways picture of their visual studio, half blurry, and say, my code doesn't work. Why? Be a professional. If you have a problem, I gave you Git. Push it to Git. Say, my, I have a problem with my thing. This is my Git repository. Go find out. I'll go clone and take a look at it in front of you. Don't say the pictures of code. Nobody does that. No one. Like you do that in the industry. You know, what are you, 12? I mean, please, please grow up out of selfies and pictures and things like that with coding. Yeah, I want to take a picture with you and your cat on TikTok. Good. Send me. I'll watch it. But please, no coding. Pictures, please. Thank you. All right. I just gave you Git. If you do .cpp files, you just went back 10 years. Instead of sending me .cpp files, put the .cpp files on Git, send me the path on Git. Like that, the good thing about it is that if you send me a .cpp file, what do I do? I find out what the problem is. Then what do I have to do? I have to fix it, send you an email with description of what was wrong. Right? It's when I help you face to face, you're sitting, I'm sitting, I open up your code, I explain, it takes one tenth, one hundredth of the time of sending an email. Because sending email and chat back and forth is extremely time consuming. You're sitting over there, I tell something, you don't understand, you immediately talk to me. I'll give you immediate feedback. That's much better. I, I know that it sounds nuts, but that's much better. You're, and I do not bite, I promise. OK? Like, you t the more you talk to me, the more I recognize you, and the more successful you will be in this subject. 
okay? Be visible. That's everywhere. You have to be visible. When you are creating your Git profile, cat killer, mass murderer, these are not good IDs, okay? <laughs> okay, don't do stuff like that. And I'm, and I'm not joking, like, because picture yourself as a 50-year-old CEO of a company that's going to be recognized by Mr. Cat Killer. Don't do that, okay? Please, okay? I'm not saying don't put, cool dude is fine, okay? Princess of whatever is nice. Some Klingon name, if you're a geek, is good. These things are fine. Okay, cool stuff are fine, but don't give yourself, don't describe yourself with things that you might change in 10 years. Okay? Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Well, it's good to have a tattoo if it's someplace that it's not showing because you don't want a red heart on your forehead when you're going to an executive meeting, right? So, so, what I'm, so, so keep your private stuff. Internet never forgets, ever, okay? Always be professional because they will Google your name to hire you, okay? Yes. You just just add a collaborator and done. Yeah, I just just add me as a collaborator, whatever repository that you want to choose to work with, and have everything in it. I want what I do. I'll go and look at the history of your commits. When I see you're an active person, you are having a commit every two days. I know that you're studying. But when I see one commit three days before the final exam, that suddenly everything came to the repository. What does it say? It means you got it from Greg, right? You know, if that's what it means, right? Like if, some, if somebody's building something, you can see the progress of things being built. If I see something, something came to existence, it means you didn't do it. You got it from someone else. It's just, it's just common sense, okay? Show me the progress. Show me that you're working, and we'll be just fine. Uh, code review. So... I do random code review with people, which means I'm going to call you and say, book a meeting, we'll talk. You bring up, you update your repository, I bring up your repository, I comment on your code, how to make it better. What did you do wrong? What, should, what you should do to make your code, code better, more, more robust, and more uh, be better. Just to give you hints of how, be a be how to be a better programmer. So we do that all the time as I'm going through your stuff, especially when I see a problem. I see that you did something that is not good. I need to talk to you about that. I'll bring up the code. I'll fix it for you. You'll see how it's fixed. You, push, you pull it, and you're not going to do that again. That's number one. Number two, uh, code review. You, you, you will do at least one code review with me to see if you're doing what you're doing, no matter how good I am in catching plagiarism. It cannot be caught until I talk to you face to face. As soon as I tell you, tell me what you have done in this piece of code, and you start talking about what you have written, that shows if you have written the code or not. Okay? If I see something, like if I see your code, I'm like, whoa, what is this? Like Elon Musk writing this code? Okay. So if I see something like that, then I'm going to call you. Explain to me what this part does. And, if you, and it was like last semester I had this guy. It was awesome. I would, I would say, what did you like? It was IPC, and the code that was written, it was using things that I've used, like when I was writing in a, 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 a networking thing. I mean, it was like crazy code in there. And I'm like, what this piece of code do? It says, because if I didn't do that, it would give me error. <laughs> that was the response to everything. What do you think? Like, uh, you are students. If somebody tells you, what this piece of code do? So, so it won't give me error. So what do you mean? What do you think? Do you think that person wrote the code? No. But if I tell you what this piece of code does, you say, I wrote a loop, and I did it like this. It didn't work, so I added that one, and it worked. I don't know why, but it worked, so I submitted it. That's perfect to me. That means you did it. And as I mention in my class all the time, cheating is allowed in my class. There is no problem with it. Get the code from your friend. No problem. Cite it. Tell me that it was two weeks, two days, two hours to the due date for the workshop, and I didn't want to miss it. I got the code from Jane. This is the piece of code that I got to make my project work. Thank you. Instead of 100%, you will get 95%. 
and I will thank you, Jane. I know you're not Jane, but it would be interesting if she was actually Jane. But anyway, so yeah, so I would say, so I, was, I will thank you, Jane, for helping you, and everything is in clear and nice, because you cited, you gave credit to someone else doing that work. Or you say, I got that from ChatGPT. Absolutely no problem. You can do that. No, seriously, you can do that. I know she, he, he does it all the time. So <laughs> no, I'm joking. But, but anyways, so but, but you do that, that is just fine. OK? It's fine that you do that and you tell me, because it was critical, I did that. And you only lose mark for that. But if I look at a piece of code that I see, this is too advanced to be done in this class. Or I didn't teach that. I'd like to know where he got it from. Then I'm going to say, Greg, how did you know? This is the thing, and it says, I have no idea, I'm saying zero. So what happens, if you don't know what your code is doing, the wor whole work for that process goes to zero. OK? <clears throat> That's the code review that I invite you to defend your code. The other code reviews that I do is just to sh tell you how things work better if you did it like that. Another code review is upon your request. You tell me for that. These are the work that I have done up to the, this part of semester. I want you to go through it and tell me what I could do best or what mistakes I made so I can fix it. You book an appointment. And that's a big plus to me. Anybody books an appointment like that with me gets lots of credit. OK? So do that so I can tell you what is good and bad about your code. I have 99 students this semester. And it's not easy to go through every single one and have a one-to-one -one thing. So I do random code reviews. I do code reviews that are fishy. But to get response, to get feedback on your code, you should care about it. And book an appointment with me. OK? Uh, I'll explain in two seconds. Thank you for the question. Through <clears throat> Microsoft Teams. So what you do, you send me a personal chat message. Say, Farad, I need, to, I need to go. Everything's in GitHub. I want to talk about it. When can we set up an appointment? That. Or <clears throat> by the end of the week, I'm going to update my calendar. So the calendar that you see over here that is all blank, it's going to get filled with places that I'm busy. OK? So you go on Microsoft Teams in the calendar. You click on New Meeting, OK? And then you add a title, what this meeting is for. So you write over here, <clears throat> Code Review, or uh, a problem at Workshop 8, or something like that. Then you click on Scheduling Assistant, and you add my name over here. Then it shows all the common free times we have. You select half an hour, not more. Half an hour, meeting on an empty time that I have and set it. And don't do it for half an hour from now, OK? If you see, oh, next 30 minutes is free, let me add it. Don't do that, because I need time to see it, right? So do it like a few days in advance. So, <clears throat> so it's guaranteed that I can see that you made an appointment. And then that appointment, simply we click on it, and a team session opens, and I'm going to take you through whatever you want to do, OK? So either you ask me to set an appointment, if that's the case, you must have your calendar updated too. You have, if you are asking me to set an appointment for you, your calendar should be updated because I'm doing the same thing. I'm going to go see when are you free on your calendar and set the time like that. And please do so, just as practice for your future work thingy. I'll, be, I'll answer it in two seconds. For your future, add everything that you have in this calendar. It's private. Nobody can see what it is. So if you're walking your dog every day at 8 o'clock between this and that, right over there walking dogs, busy. So, so it's something for yourself to know not to forget to walk your dog. And at the same time, I know that you're not there to, make, to book an appointment or classes that you have or commute time. From this time to this time, it takes for me to get to Seneca. Set all those things in your calendar. First of all, you have your schedule set and you're an organized person. Secondly, if you ask me to book an appointment with you, I can go over there and find the common time. Yes. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what I wrote, so definitely. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is just for <clears throat> the project? Like project, workshop, everything. Oh, for everything. Yeah. Okay. I have another question. Project, um, start on. Are you kidding me? It's in, the, it's in the organization. It's called OOP Project. It's, it's posted a week, 10 days ago. 
<coughs> oh, let me show you. Okay, so this is, this is the project. So you go to the organization, and it says OOP project with all the do this. Milestone 1 and 2 are already released, okay? <clears throat> so, and it's going to be, to I'll, I'll, exp I'll talk about project in two seconds, okay? I'll explain exactly how it is and how it works. Pro and and the milestone one and two is pretty simple. You can go through it very quickly. Yes. No, never. I do, I, I stopped using paper 20 years ago. <laughs> okay. Okay, I don't, I hate paper. I know, I, but, but I hate the paper cuts and I like, and I, and I do, and I hate, and I hate deciphering the cipher that you write over there. That uh, so. <laughs> oh yeah. That. Is it on paper? So you have to ask. It's possible that Brania left it on my in my, and school still promotes it. It's a for those people who like it on paper. It's good. I I never came. Like, I wrote the submitter because of that 20, 10 years, 15 years ago. Because, because I like, I, who wants to, you know, it doesn't. Well, you still use paper, especially for C++ code. Um, it's not an easy language. Um, it's not, if, even if you were writing a composition about spring, that would have been. <laughs> Anyways, Sadu. <laughs> What's in this? Giving me a buzz. <laughs> Okay. All right. So, uh, what did I want to do? The project. <clears throat> project has five milestones. First, first four milestones, loose, very loose due dates, which means the due dates that it's there, I'm asking you to obsessively try to meet it, not to fall behind. But even if you are one week late, you get the full mark. Okay, so milestone one, two, three, and four are like that. You are essentially building the engines of your, of your application. And every one of them has tests that I'm not going to do in milestone five because you passed milestone one. So milestone one, when you are doing the date thingy, when your date works properly, I'm not going to test its correctness in milestone five. That's why milestone one, two, three, and four must be submitted even if it's extra late and you get marks a mark of zero for it. Each milestone, one, two, three, and four, have 10%. It has 10% each, and uh, uh, even if you're one week late, after one week, is there is no partial, you automatically get zero for it. But you have to submit it anyway, because that's why, why milestone five is not testing those. Milestone five has six steps of submission. Very simple ones. So you don't face one big submission and lose the whole mark. Any of those six submissions are submitted successfully adds 10%. Therefore, 60% here, 40% over there, total of 100% for your project. For your project to be acceptable so you can pass the subject, you have to give me a working, successfully submitted project. The definition of a su successfully submitted project is the first four milestone and at least one of the features of milestone five. That gives you 50% for your project. If you don't do that, you get an incomplete in the subject if your average is higher than 50. If your average is not higher than 50, you will fail the subject. Okay? So if you have 70% pass, for the rest of the stuff, and your project is not submitted, you get an incomplete. Then you have to submit the project for a mark of zero and get your 70% and pass, or 60% or pass, whatever it is. So if the overall mark is a pass and you did not submit your project, that's how it's going to happen. Okay? Is that clear for everyone? All right. And so if you, if you submit these four and only one of milestone five, you get 50% and your but these have due dates that redu is, gets reduced one, so uh, I think 10% uh, each day. So you have six days to submit each one of them. So they are all due at certain time. They are all due at certain time at August 6th. And if you're one day late, 
the 10% for each becomes 9%, and it goes down to 50. Af after that becomes zero. Okay, so five days for each or six days. It explains exactly what it is. So you can be late, and you're going to lose mark on this. For these one week late, no problem. Read the project first. Go through it. The next day you're coming in, I can answer questions on what it is. For me, explaining it to you right now is a waste of time. You have to first read it for me to be able to answer questions about it. But go through it thoroughly. And some of you uh, actually submitted it, already submitted milestone one. But <clears throat> if you have any questions, just let me know. Um, most of the work is done for milestone one. Like all the tricky parts are done. You're just adding few features to it, to milestone one. And it keeps going like that. <clears throat> so by the end, you're going to create a, a library application that can check in and check out publications, essentially. OK? And it saves every, so it's a stateful program. You're going to save everything in a file. And so it's a working application for a, for a very simple library. Uh, questions down to this point? I'll fix that uh, because our, all our labs are t on Tuesday and, fri and Friday. Probably I'm going to make the due date for labs something like Monday and then uh, do the reflection for like five days after, like that, something like that, for all my sections. So I'll set that one up. And there are no both parts, there's only one part. The uh, workshop 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, they only have one part because project is in. Because a project, project replaces a DIY. Yes? So is my lab doing one part? Sure. Lab, workshop, potatoes, potatoes. So it, it starts from one project? Yes. Workshop 6 is one part. And the DIY is changed with the project. But the due dates of the project milestones has nothing to do with workshops. Depending on how big or small they are, they have shorter due dates. And so one milestone may have two days only, and other milestones has 14 days, depending on what that milestone is covering. OK? Uh, <clears throat> any questions? Sorry, regarding uh, we said Monday, so we are assigned uh, this week's lab slash this coming Monday? Yes. So I have to, again, give me till the end of the week to set my stuff up. OK. I'm still recovering uh, from vacation. <laughs> you were saying about quit. Yeah, in the lab only. In the lab only if I have time. I rather, I rather, I want to do the project. Um, I want to cover the lectures properly so you, so you understand everything. And Good for me, the second half of the semester is so well connected that I can teach three weeks in two hours with everybody being happy. Everybody being happy. Not to just <laughs> babble through it. Like, I'll finish it and everybody says, uh-huh, but then you look at it, you see two weeks is covered. Okay? So because of that, most likely every lab that you're coming, except from tomorrow, you're going to have a quiz in it, OK? The quiz covers everything that I taught and a couple of questions on what, we have, what, what is to come. But the questions that are from what is to come are very, I can call it superficial, like something very you know, on surface, just asking about to see if you actually glanced at the material or not. So the week ahead, there's no two lectures ahead. No, I'm going to ask from OP345. What you got? I'm joking. <laughs> it's, it's only next semester. It's only next semester. It's only next week. Yeah, only next topic. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, any questions? Yes. No, that I was just explaining. Monday. Okay. I'm setting it up. Give me time, please. Por favor. Thank you. All right. Yes. No, they are from three weeks ago. Okay, okay. But maybe three or four will be. Yeah, usually I, um, you will see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, we'll see. What is that? This? The whole thing. Okay. Any questions about me? Anything you want to know before we before I'm going to poke your brains? Huh? Uh, my garage, my backyard. <laughs> One uh, a couple of weeks we went south, but uh, the rest working at home like a dog. So I'm I'm happy to come back to a restful place that I can teach and enjoy my life. <laughs> it was two, two, two months of manual labor. <laughs> yes. Uh, I do hardcore programming subjects. I've, uh, I've, uh, um, I've, uh, now I'm gonna poke your brains. Why do I do that? I want to know what you know so I can actually start. The way I teach the class is going to be like this. So I'll start from one person and I ask a question. That person answers the question. I take that answer and mold it to another question from the next person. And I keep going like that. If you're not in the mood, you don't want to talk to me. You had a bad day. You had a fight with your girlfriend or boyfriend or wife or something. You don't want to answer the thing. You simply say pass. It goes to the next person. If you hear pass three times, you can come to rescue. I'll answer the, you answer the question and I continue from there and we keep going. I'll keep teaching like that throughout the semester so you know how it's done. Are we good with this? What is object orientation? Or it's better to say why object orientation? Let's say what is object orientation? I'm a seven, a seven year old, you want to just give me your idea and there is no wrong answer to this. I just want to know what do you think an ob object orientation is. You can say pass if you want to. What is object orientation? I think that it's just focusing on an object is. Just what is an object? <laughs> so what is the difference between a class and an object? So these blocks are objects or classes? Well, uh, so when I said, what is the difference between class and an object? She says, blocks, blocks, blocks. So these blocks are objects or classes? Now translate that as if I'm a seven-year-old. <laughs> no, you're good. You, what you're saying is good. There's a very simple answer to that. What is the difference between class and an object? Because he said, you know, I'm going to stay, stay on you. What is, it? what is the difference between a class and an object? Thank you. So class is the design. Object is that design materialized. Okay, so when I say integer i, which one is the class? I have an int, so int i semicolon. Int i semicolon. Is int the class or i? Sorry. Hey, uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> Don't say a thing. Don't say a thing. Int i. Which one is the class? Is int the class or i the class? Based on what I said, one is design, the other one is the materialization of that design. So i is the class and i? Exact opposite, actually. <laughs> int is the class. Int, why? 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 Because I can say, Now I have one class and I created 100 instances out of it. So a class is the design and objects are variables we create out of. Why the heck we do that? Why not just go back to C and live our lives happy? Why object orientation?
What does it mean to encapsulate? What is, why do I want to have the, why do I want to have the data and logic together? I had my data in some erasency, then I had my logic in some functions, they just work fine. Why do I need to have my data and logic together? Okay, <laughs> okay. Why do I why do I do in caps? By the way, uh, let's go back. We're gonna go back over there. You said encapsulate things, right? Was it you that say encapsulate? There are three pillars of object orientation. Encapsulation and ah, you went out of order. No, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So <laughs> polymorphism. So encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. Let's let's talk about those things. Encapsulation. Why do we encapsulate things? The thing is that in real life, everything's encapsulated. When somebody calls the number of this phone, which phone is going to ring? Why not that? Because the data is encapsulated with this one. The data of this phone has its number. And when it rings, it calls the ring function of this class. C++ doesn't do that. Sorry, C doesn't do that. With C, you have a function called ring, and you have to put the cell phones and the arguments inside ring. That doesn't make sense. It's as if if I want to talk, I have to go to a talking booth. Otherwise, I can't talk. That's the difference. Encapsulation means data and behavior together. And it actually adds privatization. It privatizes things. Going back to why object-oriented, I always give this example in my classes, and I want you to really close your eyes and imagine and picture what I'm, gonna, what I'm about to tell you. Okay? It's been a hard day. You worked hard. You go home, have a nice meal, go to bed. It's 2 o'clock in the morning, and you're sound asleep. Picturing that? You hear, hello. You think you're dreaming. You hear, hello again. You wake up, you look around. Nobody's there. And while you're looking around, you hear, hello. What happens? What, do you, what are you, you going to do? What happens to you in your state of mind? <laughs> Pooping your pants, right? <laughs> right? Definitely. No, seriously, think about it. You, why? What went wrong here? <laughs> hello. Come in. You're just on time. So we are saying, to brief the thing, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, we are sound asleep, and suddenly we hear hello. <laughs> OK? We wake up, nobody's here, and while we are looking around and turning out the light, we hear hello again, but nobody's there. I'm asking, what do we feel? And we came to the conclusion that we're going to pee our pants. OK? Are we OK with that? What went wrong with that? What is wrong in this picture, picture that makes us pee in our pants? Why? You heard a hello, somebody's greeting you. Yeah, you should be happy. You cannot find the source of hello. We had a function without an owner. We had a function without an owner. We did not have encapsulation. You follow what I'm saying? If I had a, if you, if it's two o'clock in the morning and your six-year-old sister or your six-year-old daughter comes beside the bed and says, hello, and you wake up and you say, oh, I'm scared, I got a nightmare, I want to sleep with you. Say, sure, no problem. Nothing's wrong. Why? Because hello came from a source that you could see. The function had an owner. That's not C language. In C language, functions are everywhere without an owner. In here, we give the function to an owner. Now, scenario number two. We are all good and nice. Yes? Mm. No. Oh, structure in what? In C++ or in C? In C, I would say no, but I'm lying to you. We used to write object-oriented programs using C. In C. It's a very tricky way, but you can. 
using function pointers and stuff like that we don't want to go through. But it's, it's as if I'll give you primitive tools and I'm going to tell you build a building and you're not allowed to use a bulldozer or something. It's, it's possible, but it's very difficult. We have the tools. Why we call it C++, by the way? Why plus plus? What is plus plus in C? To add. What does plus plus do? Adds one, right? So C++ is C language plus object orientation. That's why they say C++. And those people who don't like C++ make fun of it. It says even the name has a bug. Because, 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 because it's not going to be object oriented until the, 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 the language is done with. Because <laughs> plus plus is done after, right? So, but anyway, so, so having said that, so scenario is going to change to this. I have that six year old now. I have that six year old now. So we are all good down to that six year. So you wake up, you see your six year old daughter or sister comes to the side of it. You open your eyes and she says, hello. What would you do with like Arnold Schwarzenegger's voice? You're going to pee your pants again. Why? Because again, encapsulation didn't happen. It did not use the object of your six-year-old sister. Did not use the attribute tone of voice of your sister. Each object uses its own attributes. That's why everything makes sense. That's why if Arnold comes at six two o'clock in the morning to your room, that's scarier even. <laughs> and says hello with that. I said you're fine because you know. You follow what I'm saying? So that's, that's the thing. So that's what encapsulation does. It puts the data and behavior together. Why? Because our brain works that way. They design the C language to be object-oriented so it makes sense, so we can solve complex, we, we can have complex solution for a complex world. In structured language, you have to jump through hoops to make things work. In C++, you create an object, you design it, say, shoo, it works by itself, right? So that's encapsulation. And another thing about encapsulation, like if you are going for a coffee, you got to tell me, Farda, do you have money? I forgot to bring my wallet. And I say, yes. And we go, I'll get you a coffee, right? Well, what happens if we are going to have coffee, you don't have money, and you put your hand in my pocket to see if I have money? <laughs> Probably you got to get a slap in the face, right? What went wrong? That's privacy. That's why you can make things private. And only my accessor methods that is asking me, do you have money, can give you that data. And if I don't want to buy you, I have plenty of money in my pocket. I don't want to buy you a coffee. I can choose to say, no, I don't. He's going your pocket. Isn't that similar to pressure? Yeah, exactly. That's why in object orientation, friends are only for knife in the back. If you see friend anywhere, it means you have lack of design. You don't know how to program. Friends are completely not allowed in my code. But workshop six is. I know. We are asking you to do, in workshop six, we are making a class friend, right? Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. That's not friendship. The C++ created the keyword friend, but they were nice geek people. They called it friend. They should have called it owner. OK? Friendship is ownership. It's like you have a dog. You're a friend of your dog, right? You can take it to the vet and put it down. <laughs> right? Are you its friend or its owner? Owner. I have a dog. I love my dog. I'm like, it's my dog, like my daughter. I'm serious. But I can. There is no friendship over there. It gives you full authority to do what you want to do. The reason you have the friendship over there to show you that the class text owns the line. A line cannot exist without a text. That's why it's fully private. You cannot even instantiate a line. A line can only be instantiated through text. That's why it's its friend. It owns it. It's like an array and its elements. You have an array, and you have elements in an array, right? You cannot just have an element. An element needs an array to exist in. So an element, so an array becomes a friend of an element, which means it owns the element. It can create the elements. Are we okay with friendship now? All right. That was encapsulation. Inheritance. To reuse design. Inheritance is what functions did to structured programming. 
you created a function to reuse your code. But in object-oriented programming, it's much more than just code. You are designing whole functional objects. I have a bicycle that works perfectly. And we have millions of them out there. But I'm tired of pedaling. So what I do, I'm going to say, I'm going to stick an engine on that thing. I'm going to call it a motorcycle. I don't need to recreate a bicycle. I get the design of a bicycle. I inherit a motorcycle out of it. Don't be mistaken. Objects cannot inherit with each other. I'm not inheriting anything from my father. My father is the same instance. Me and my father are instances of male human beings. That's what it is. It is nothing more than that. And me and my mother, my mother had a function called birth that returned a human being. That, call, that function was called by my father, and I came out. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just implementing, I'm just implementing human reproduction through object orientation. OK? So, so that's what it is. That's essentially what it is. OK? But if you think about it, I am a mammal. That's correct inheritance. I'm inheriting everything from mammal species. OK? If I say a flying object, a flying object can fly, right? So an airplane can fly, a pigeon can fly, uh, uh, a, a, a rocket can fly, a mosquito can fly. But I just said fly, 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 right? So if I say flying object, fly. It doesn't matter what type of flying object. It will call the proper action. And the proper flying for that object happens. Did I call a different function? No. It's all the same functions, but they perform proper action based on their inheritance, right? That's polymorphism. Doing the same thing in different ways. Doing the same thing in different ways. When you have a function, an action that is called the same, but it works in a different way based on circumstances of the object and class, that's called polymorphism. A very crude and ugly way of it is to create uh, overloading functions. You create an add function with two integers and an add function with two doubles. They're both add. But one works with two integers. The other one works with two doubles. Right? It looks like it's polymorph. It is polymorphic kind of a thing. But behind the thing is just a lie. Because C++ calls the first one int, add int int and calls the second one add double double. So they are different in name, really. But what we say is that the signature of a function in C++ is the name and the arguments, where signature in a, in a C thingy is only its name. And that's the third pillar of object orientation, and therefore we have the big hoopla. If we follow these things in synergy, what is the meaning of? I didn't ask a question from you, did I? Did I? Well, do you know what is the meaning of synergy? When things are working together with harmony. So I cannot just have a random polymorphism and some inheritance and, and some encapsulations call my ap application object-oriented. They should actually get designed properly and have some kind of a meaning to be object-oriented. And that's what we call object-orientation. Are we OK with this? And why object-orientation? Because we live in a world of object-oriented design. Everything in the world is object-oriented when you think about it. If I tell you what is this, you say it's a laptop. When I tell you what is this, it's a laptop. When I tell you what is this, it's a laptop. They are all laptops. But each one has its own functionalities and specification and power and everything. When we say students, I have one class student. And look at all the objects. Not two of them are the same. Each one of you have its own properties have its own attributes. Each one have their own laptops, different ones. One has long hair, the other one has short hair. One is female, the other one is male. One is gay, the other one is... We have different types of things, but we are all students. Are we okay with this? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? Sold. So, That was object-oriented. Hello. 
that was, um, I'm hiding beside here so nobody can see me. Um, uh, let me just see what is the next thing we have over here. Oh, that's not the one. Uh, I want to see what I talked about. We talked about uh, modular program. What's the difference between a module in C and C++? Anybody? Can you tell me, my friend over there? Like when we say a module in C, how does it differ with a module in C++? Do you know? Do you remember modules in C? You want to pass or you want to answer? No, 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 no. You already answered. That's not <laughs> a module in C. What, when we say module, what do we mean? Do you remember it by any chance? A module in C, do you remember what it was? A module in C? A module in C, you don't remember it? That's it, a header file and a source code. Why everybody knows it and nobody says it. I'm not going to bite you. It's a header file and a source code. Okay, why did we have a header file and a source code? It was a sorry attempt to put relative stuff together in a module so we don't have to look for it. We tried so hard to put everything in a C file and a header file so they all go together and we call it, this is my toolbox or whatever we have, and these are all relative to each other. We don't have that in C++. In C++, a class contains a module. The definition of a class becomes in a header file. The implementation goes in a CPP file. So a class occupies a module. And it all makes sense because everything in a class is automatically related to itself. I don't need to think what's going to go in there. I may have some friend functions. I may have some helper functions, friend functions. I may have some helper functions over there that help specifically to work with that class, but that's obvious. So modules in C++ are much easier to handle. And that brings us to dynamic memory allocation, the nemesis of all the students that brings nightmares, that two-year-old with Arnold's voice talking about object orientations, uh, so talking about dynamic memory allocation. So what is dynamic memory allocation? Dynamic memory allocation is the exact, is the solution that the problem with statically allocated memory creates for us. A statically allocated memory is a memory that is given to you within the executable of the program. When you say it, integer a5, it creates a pointer called a, it creates five integers inside your executable, and a points to it. So you say a0, that's the first element. a1 is the second, and you keep going like that. It's inside your executable. When you run the program, operating system grabs the executable, puts it in memory, and it runs. When it's finished, operating system takes your executable out of the memory, and with it goes your array, correct? So you don't need to worry about it. But there is a problem with that. It means at programming time, you need to know what is the size of that integer. You cannot size of that array. You cannot change that size. If I simply ask you to write the simplest program, ask you, write a program that receives some integers and prints them in reverse order, or sorts them and prints them off. It is impossible to do unless you know how many integers you have. You will say, OK, I'm going to get 1,000. What if it's 1,001? I'm going to take a million. What is a million and one? There is no proper solution for it. Any number you put, it could be more. Because of that, I need to know what the size of the array is at runtime and create it at runtime. Therefore, that allocation cannot be done when I'm programming. I have to do it after the program runs. Ask the user, how many integers do you have? 53. So I'm going to create an array with size of 53. When program is running, and that, ladies and gentlemen, cannot be in our executable because the executable is already in memory. It cannot change. It has to be outside. Because of that fact, just a second, because of that fact, I have a command in C++ that can act 
do exactly that, which means I only have my pointer, but through a new statement, I ask the operating system to give me five integers somewhere in shared memory and give me the address. It works exactly like the statically allocated memory, absolutely no difference. The difference is that the memory is outside and not inside the executable. Are we good? Yes, sir. All right. So that's that. Are we okay down to this point? But there is a problem with this. With power comes responsibility. Now that you do this, when the program ends, the executable goes out of the memory, correct? Ta-da! Memory leak. Have your router or internet thingy at home ever went back and you called Bell and said, unplug it, wait for 15 minutes and put it back in. Remember, have you done that? That's memory leak. Because they wrote a program, the program leaks as connections are made and stuff like that, packets of information, it leaks a little bit of memory into, into modems or your internet router's memory. And it keeps, and the program, and the connection is over, and the memory is still there. Next one comes in, next, and two months passes, your memory is full, function doesn't, the router doesn't work anymore. What do they do? Unplug, reset everything, go back in. We say a leaked memory stays in your memory forever. What is forever in computer science? Until you reboot, right? right. That's memory leak, which we want to prevent. Are we okay with this? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? Are we okay three? Sold, okay, all right, so. How do we do dynamic memory allocation so we don't shoot ourselves in the foot? That's one of the most important, and that's one of the things that made all the programming industry say C++ is a dangerous language. It is dangerous because it gives you power, and with power, you can do bad things. You, like, you have a gun at home, 70%, you're gonna shoot yourself, your family, or, or than a thief, right? That's what happens. It's the same thing with C++, give you power. If you don't know how to do it, you're gonna shoot yourself in the foot. Your program's gonna crash. You have to, to, to own a gun. Have you went through the rules of it? It has, the gun has to be in a safe. The ammunition has to be in a separate safe. You have to have the combination here. They, they give you such restrictive and thing, rules to follow not to shoot yourself in the foot. We do the same thing with dynamic memory allocation. There are a specific set of rules that you have to follow not to make a boo-boo. What the boo-boo is, again, I know that I fit, it's, it feels like a broken record because you've already been taught with this, but this is so important. I wanna do a thorough review on it before we continue, and I hope you appreciate that, okay? Um, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, a pause down here. Anything I do in here goes on GitHub immediately. Like for example, I just talked about this dynamic memory allocation, right? And we are in section NBB, correct? And this is July 1st Schmigli dinghy, right? July 6th, right? Pardon me? This is July 6th, right? Yeah. No, 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 I'm, I'm gonna show you soon. So this is my repository on this computer. So I write over here and I say git commit, and I'm gonna say July 6th stuff, okay? And wait a minute, before I do that, I wanna make sure that the previous classes actually have, previous class has everything that they want it. The previous class was ZAA. No, they don't have it. Do they? I thought I added it. Was it ZAA? Give me a second. Let me see. Give me a second. Oh, it was NAA. Sorry, NAA. It is there. Okay? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to this commit thingy that I had over here. Remind me later. It keeps telling me that you need to update. And I'm going to click all to add all the new files to it. And I'm going to say July 6th stuff and I'm gonna say commit and push. So it commits to the local repository and then pushes everything up to GitHub. So when you go to the OP244 organization, you look at OP244 NAA NBBZ A notes, you click over there, you will see that section NBB is there. And in NBB, 
these are the stuff that we have done. This is July 6th. This is the presentation. And this is the silly program I've written. OK? Everything will be up. Everything is going to be up right after the class. You don't need to take notes. The notes are there. But please, by all means, try to go and fiddle with them. It is important that you do. All right? So let's continue. Actually, it's 11.10. We are done at 11.35. Is that correct? Or 30? 35 or 30? 30? 35. OK. You want five minutes break? Anyone wants a break? Sure? Sure. OK. So five minutes break, and I'll continue with DMA, dynamic memory allocation. In workshop zero, I'm asking you to do this, which means have a repository. And by the way, uh, I have an IPC 144 review that I did for OP244 students a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Uh, they're all there with all the videos and everything. So I reviewed the whole IPC 144 before OP244 begins like this. So I have a class that is ready for 244. You can spend, it's like a nine hour session, one day, okay? You can go through it and watch it. It goes through everything with IPC, okay? <laughs> Dynamic memory allocation. We just learned what it is and why we need it. So let's take a look at it and see what precautions we have to uh, look for. So let me just bring it up. So we can create a dynamic memory for any type. Now, types can be two different ones. They can be, so when I say a type, what do I mean? Data type. Data type. So but the data type in C++ is a primitive type. And any compound type that is made out of a composite, whatever you call it, out of other types. Like you have an employee with five things in them. OK? So I can create a pointer to any type. The very first mistake that you can make is that you create a type, a pointer, and directly use it. A pointer that is not initialized or set to any value is a useless thing. It's like you have an envelope with no address on it, and you mail it. It's going to go nowhere, because there is no address in it. And as a matter of fact, when you do something, there is an address in there, but it's some garbage address. What is an address? Where is it? I, I went right back. So you're my victim again. What is an address in C language? Do you remember? When we say address, what is, what is an address? What, is, what, what do we mean by address? You can pass. You want to pass? What is an address? It's just the place where the is. And how is it represent, represented? So it cannot be a regular integer value. It has to be hexadecimal. OK, hexadecimal. Regular, they're all the same thing. OK, I can say 16, or I, I can say 16, or I can say 1, 0 hexadecimal. They are both integers. So the fact that you always see it as hexadecimal, it doesn't have to be, which means uh, an address is simply an integer value that is unsigned, an unsigned integer value. An address is nothing but an unsigned integer value. What does that unsigned integer value represent? Like, if an address is 152, what does it mean? Ba -ba -ba. The lady over here. Yeah. No, 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 no. I have an address. I have integer pointer P, and P has the value 152 in it. What does it mean? It keeps a value inside 150. Second byte of memory. It it starts there, right? Right. So an address an address is simply an integer value. So when you say integer pointer whatever, it's just an integer. When you say employee pointer e, that e is a pointer. It's just an integer. 
all pointers are just unsigned integer. It's the target that is different. That's why the pointers are different. I don't want to review, but maybe I'll review the pointers later on. We'll just watch that review for IPC 144. Okay? A pointer is essentially an unsigned integer that indicates that, that, that refers to a sequence number in your memory. So when you say 152 in a pointer, it means 152nd byte of the memory of your laptop. That's what it means. Okay, so a pointer is nothing but an integer number. When you do not initialize, there is an integer number in there. That is garbage, some big number. And when you set it to something, that is pointing somewhere outside of your territory. That's why that uninitialized value will cause trouble and gives you Valgrind errors. Valgrind, Valgrind, whatever, Valgrind error, <laughs> okay? So if you do something like that, if you use an uninitialized thing, on some compilers, that uninitialized value is zero by default. Because some compilers, when you don't say anything, make it zero, it works on your local computer. But when you move it to matrix, that is not zero anymore. It's some garbage, or the other way or some value, and Valgrind says, hey, you are trying to use a pointer that is not set to anything. I'm not going to allow you to do that. I'll give you a warning. That's one of the first mistakes with dynamic memory allocation, using a memory that is not set. Also, you may actually be a nice person and set it to null pointer, but again, try to set values. That's null pointer assignment. Null means unset. Null is a safe empty state for a pointer. Do you know what a safe empty state is for a class? Does anybody tell you what is a safe empty state for a class? It's just that no, it has nothing to do with deletion. It's just a safe. It identifies a class as unusable. A safe empty state, th that's one of the mistakes. When you have, when you set something as empty, when you set something as empty, if, if this is, it's this water bottle, the empty doesn't mean error. It means there's, there's no water in here, right? But if I have a safe empty state, it means this water is not usable. Safe empty state flags an object as unusable. Null pointer does that to uh, a pointer. When you set a pointer to null, even if you delete it, the delete won't do anything because it knows it's an unusable pointer. Okay? So that's one good thing. But if you actually set it to null and try to set values or use it, it's going to tell you, hey, what are you doing? It's null. Why are you setting it? And that's a null pointer exception. So what you do, you create the size that you want, you keep track of that size all times, and you stay within the limit of that size. If you go out of that size even by one, that's again another segmentation fault, because you're out of your segment. And you're lucky if you get the segmentation fault. Sometimes you have immediately something after that belongs to you, and you don't notice. That's the worst type of bug, that it doesn't crash. It waits for you seven years from now when you're happy and you are on a vacation, and that's when it's going to crash. Okay? So you have to be careful. These things, you have to obsessively follow them. If you don't, it's going to come back and haunt you at worst time possible, because Murphy's Law is always at work. What is Murphy's Law? What is, who's the next person? Did I ask you? What is Murphy's Law? You know what's Murphy's Law? You know what's Murphy's Law? You know what's Murphy's Law? Okay, Murphy's Law says, Murphy's Law says, Murphy's law means when you think the worst thing is not going to happen, it will definitely happen. It's Murphy's law. 
and it is a Murphy's law. Like you are, you are going to go to the appointment of your lifetime to get job at Google. That's the time that your car will have a flat tire. That's Murphy's law. You follow what I'm saying? When things may go wrong, they will. Okay, that's what Murphy's law is at work. If you do not obsessively follow the rules not to have memory problems, you will have it at the worst time. And the damn thing doesn't show, doesn't show its face, face the first time. Valgrind is one of those beautiful things that shows you at time. So what happens is that you run it on Visual Studio, crappy operating system, Windows. Let you do anything. Who have all memory leaks and you have? I'm going to run your program anyway. Okay? But when you bring it on Matrix and run it through Valgrind, it checks every single possible thing that can go wrong and catches you right there. So you need to understand what those problems are and try to fix it. And sometimes you just can't. It's so complicated. Anyways, don't go off your limit and always stay within. When your when your data is pointing at something, when you're, because you are following the rule of setting to null when not used, you can always delete the pointer you are about to allocate memory in it. Why? So this doesn't happen. If your memory is pointing at something and you allocate a new thing, after the allocation is done, everything looks just fine and dandy, but the problem is that you're going to have memory leak because the previous point, the previous memory the pointer used to point to now has no reference to it. And that's, again, that memory leak that happens when your modem has to get rebooted. So correct state of a pointer is to always be null. Always be null. And the size that you are keeping track of, be zero. Or you have one way of knowing what the size of your memory is. But because it's dynamic, you have to have some way of knowing how much memory you have. You have to keep track of it yourself, because the uh, compiler won't. And there's one thing in the other class that told that, did, did, uh, did, do, you know about, uh, do you know about universal way of initializing things in C++? Curly brackets? Did they tell you about curly brackets? You know curly brackets? You can put empty curly brackets in front of anything, and it initializes it. Right? So, so if, I, if I am creating and I have a dynamic thing that is supposed to be the name, What else? Give me something else. Uh, uh, GPA? GPA, someone says, right? Something like that, okay? Always, so, and in here, I'm going to have, I don't know, public, and I'm going to have student, and that's my default constructor, right? Don't set these things in your constructors. Initialize them right over there so they are set in all constructors. So what happens is that come right over here and do this. That guarantees that you have a clean class to work with. Yes? Is there any way to get around like when debugging or step by step it will go to the header and go to each of yes. the initials? Is there a way to skip that? Why do you want to skip that? You're debugging. You want all the keystrokes that you want. With debugging, you have to go in detail. It has to show you every single thing you want to do. If you can skip one thing in debugging, you're going to skip your errors, and you won't notice it, because you're too confident. So you know, that will work perfectly. I'm not going to look at that. That's what debugging. That's why that's what, you can always press F, uh, F7, I think, goes step into or step over. You can go step over. There's a step over option. That means poof, runs the whole thing and goes through it. But don't do it. It's good for your health to go through it in detail. Yes? It, it essentially says set it to default. 
For a pointer, it's null. For an integer, it's zero. For a double, it's zero. So essentially, you know what? I always do that. You know what it does? It sets all the bits of that thing to zero. Therefore, everything goes. If it's a class, it, it calls its default constructor. And if your default constructor only is supposed to do that and nothing else, so let's say I have another constructor over here for the student. Let's say I have another constructor over here for the student that sets the name. And what else? Uh, uh, and student number, let's say. Okay? So, so you want to implement this and do whatever is needed. But you do not want to, but your default constructor is supposed to do just this that you have done, right? So what you do, you create, either you put an empty body for this, either you, you do this, it means my default constructor doesn't need to do anything because they're all initialized anyway. Either you do this or you can do this. Which means create an empty default constructor for me. Default constructors will not get created if you create any const look at that. Default constructors will not get created if you create any constructor. Is that correct? Everybody's okay with that? If you want to overwrite that and make the compiler do it for you anyway, even if you have a constructor, you say student default, which means create the empty default constructor for me anyway. I'm going to need it. And because you did it like this, then you don't need to do anything. You don't need to set the GPA zero in here because you already did that over there. You follow? Yes. You're talking about when this is getting executed? Yeah, so it, all these things happen and default does nothing because there's nothing in it. So all these things happen anyway. This happens in any case of creation, in all constructors. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I said it sets all the bits to zero. That means whatever zero is for that which means 0, 0.0 for double, 0 for int. It sets all the bits to 0. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. And if you are doing that for a, if you are doing that for a class, it calls its default constructor. So this initialization thing works for anything. I can do it like this over here. I can do this. See? You don't need to put an assignment or anything. It means set the first element to 1, the next one to 2, and the rest 0. Or I can do this. OK? If I do something like this, it automatically calls the default constructor for every single one. All right? Or if I do this, it will call this constructor for you. This is a universal initialization way. You don't need to put braces. You can put a curly bracket in front of it instead. It works. Same way. You don't need to put an assignment in front of it or anything. You could, but why? Right? So all these things work. That's why it's a universal way of doing it. And it's very helpful, believe me. It is very helpful. All right? So that's what I wanted to tell you. So. Anything new that I teach you, use it, you use it from now on. Yeah, of course. 
it makes you, believe me, you're, gonna, you're not going to see those errors that you see. It's, it makes your life easier, trust me. Okay? Uh, okay? What do I, yes? Yeah. Yeah, that would do the same thing. No difference. No difference. It is, but, but you can do, the, uh, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. If, even if you do, you notice what he said? Having this here or not have it will do the same. It doesn't make any difference. Okay? And if I had something like this over here, actually, I don't need to have the body over there. Let's assume that it's going to be implemented somewhere. Got it? That's why it's universal. Okay? It means this is going to, the first one is going to be one, two, three, four, and the rest is going to be. Yeah, it's just, it's kind of enforcing, hey, I know that it's default and it's going to be default. One thing that I want to always mention to you at the, oh my God, it's 1138. Have a beautiful day. We have to be gone. We'll continue the rest of the next day.